You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. Today we revisit one of our Facebook Lives on the Small Animal Vet Rehabbers Facebook group. For those of you that don't know, we have four groups. We've got the Small Animal Vet Rehabbers, Equine Vet Rehabbers, Hydro Vet Rehabbers, and our Business Vet Rehabbers. We have a great community of Vet Rehabbers that encourage and support one another. They share tips and advice, and you never need, ever need to feel alone in your practice ever again. You can just head over to Facebook and come and connect and join with us. So this live was with Caroline McIntyre from McIntyre Canine Rehab. She chats to us about the importance as well as the hows and whys of warming up and cooling down our canine athletes. So you're going to enjoy this one. Over to Anae and Carolyn. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Facebook Live. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be chatting about warming up and cooling down, uh, particularly athletes. Caroline, please introduce yourself. Um, let us know about your history, how you got involved in rehabilitation and in agility. Perfect. Sure. So I'll just sort of, hi, everybody. I'm Carolyn. I'm a registered physiotherapist. And I um, let, let's get into first agility and how I got started in agility before I get into sort of what I do right now. Um, I've, uh, I always had dogs when I was a young age and I got my first dog when I was 13 and started just falling in love with training off the bat. I just love training dogs and working dogs and seeing their dogs, you know, see, see how their minds work. And so I started training at 13, um, uh, my first dog and I got into the sport of agility in the late nineties. So sort of dating me a little bit now because I've been involved with the sport for a while. Um, and I always started with weed and terriers. So before I had any of my herding dogs that I have now, I started with weed and terriers. And um, as, as a kid growing up, I was always into sports. I was always very athletic. I always had a very competitive side to me. Um, and so, you know, I was doing my sports on my side, but then when I got my first dog, I was like, oh, this would be so cool if I could do something competitive with my dog and how interesting would this be? And, you know, what sort of sports are out there for the dogs? And so anyway, so this sort of continued. I was training dogs and starting to get into agility and things like that. And then, you know, I was involved in sports, always had a few injuries. Is anybody on here who's been athletic? They have suffered in some way, shape or form with an injury. And that sort of led me to a career as a physiotherapist. So I graduated um, in 2008 with um, my degree in physiotherapy. And I specialized for 12 years in human geriatrics and I did home care work, which was awesome. Um, but then five years ago, um, almost six years ago now, is I finally got my first herding dog. So I had weed and terriers my entire life, but I finally wanted a dog that maybe just matched my intensity a little bit more, was a little bit more competitive. Um, so I brought home my first Australian Shepherd, Quinn. And in the first few weeks, um, what I learned about her was that she had no self-preservation. She would run into things. She was this little, um, just, she was just a firecracker of a dog. And so I was thinking at that time, you know, how do you prevent injuries in dogs? Like there's got to be a way. I had obviously the human side of things, um, but I was wondering, you know, how would this work in dogs, right? There's, there's got to be a way to prevent injuries. We prevent injuries in our human athletes. This can't be really that different. So I started to dive into the research behind it. And then that led me to going through my schooling um, in rehabilitation for dogs through the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. And uh, basically what I did is mirrored the two. So my physio, my love for physio and my love for dog train sort of combined them because what I realized is that all the same benefits we get from humans in terms of strength training programs um, and warming up and cooling down, um, the same benefits can be applied for the dogs. You just have to tweak things a little bit differently because they're dogs versus humans. Um, so I started my canine rehab practice now uh, four years ago in August and I specialize in canine athletes. Um, so I have in-person consults that I do. I do have a clinic that's close to me that I see dogs at. And then I also have a very big presence online and work with clients all over the world to build their um, conditioning programs for their dogs. So there's sort of an in-person mm -hmm. session and then there's online consults. 
Um, and now I just primarily work, I mean, 95% of my caseload is canine athletes either around the world or, mm -hmm. or sort of local to where I live. Um, I have four dogs now, so I still have my Aussie Quinn. She's my oldest uh, at five right now. And then I have three Shelties. I seem to fall into the realm of Shelties. I'm, I seem to be a Sheltie collector at the moment. Um, so I have a four-year-old boy named 50. I have an 18-month-old named Shades. And then my youngest is Little Keeper, who's five months. And all those dogs train, uh, train in agility. They all compete as well, obviously, except the little one. Um, and then they also do obedience uh, and confirmation. So we're involved in a lot of different sports, a lot of different training. Um, so that's really how everything happened. It all stemmed from my Aussie Quinn just being a reckless dog, which I'm sure, again, many people on here have dogs that no self-preservation. They'd sooner run into things than, than slow down and stop. It's, uh, it's a common problem we see in a lot of high drive sport dogs. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So it was so important to me to figure out, you know, how do we get injury prevention in these dogs um, and, and learn the education behind it. That's fantastic. I love Wheaton Terriers. They're so They're gorgeous. Great dog. They're and, great dogs. They're great dogs. I love that you're doing uh, a lot of online work, um, you know, a lot of online consulting. I think there's so much value in that, especially now um, in the world that we live in. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, going forward as well, it just, it saves time. It saves money. It's, um, you know, it's simple for the clients. So I just, I love online consultations and I'm, I'm very keen to see where they go in the future. Um, it's so just it, to... Well, just Sorry. even, that's okay. That's okay. So w with the online world too, you can just, I find you can reach so many people, right? Like if I look at the number of hours mm -hmm. I have in a day to see somebody, it, it's sort of limited. But online and, and whether you do courses, I started to do courses last May is when I started offering my first online conditioning course. I'm um, the canine physio practitioner for Team Canada um, for last year as well as this year. Obviously, we didn't get to go this year to the World Championships with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of got halted. So we didn't get to Belgium, which I was looking forward to pancakes in Belgium. I hear Belgian pancakes are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I heard, you know, launching online courses last year as well, in addition to the coaching. And it's just, again, the reach that you can get. And there's so many people yeah. who are in areas that just don't have access to this. They don't have canine yeah. rehab. They don't have somebody that they can sort of bounce ideas about their dog off. So I feel for, for practitioners like myself, it's important to get, get that information out there so we can educate as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. You have a very particular interest in conditioning. So can you yes. tell us a little bit about <laughs> like what is conditioning? And then you've you've told us where it comes from. No, you haven't told us where the specific interest in conditioning <laughs> comes from. So please share that. And then why it's so important to you. Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> for me, conditioning is all about preventing injury. So when we're talking about conditioning, we're talking about the workouts. OK, hmm. so we're talking about actually overloading muscles um, to get some sort of benefit, whether it's strength, whether it's body awareness, whether it's flexibility. So I always use the example as if, you know, I grab a pen and I start doing bicep curls. I'm not I'm not conditioning. Right. I might be moving my bicep hmm. through a range of motion, but I'm not actually conditioning. But if you give me a 10 pound weight and now I do 10 repetitions of something, that's where I'm actually going to start to fatigue the muscle out. And when you fatigue a muscle, you basically break muscles apart. Um, muscles have tons of little spindles uh, and fibers, and you actually start breaking a few of them as um, you're working out, which is a normal process, because then as the body goes to repair itself, it repairs itself stronger to withstand that resistance. That's why if you do 10 pound bicep curls in three or four weeks, 10 pounds is gonna seem pretty easy. Why? Because your body has adapted. OK, so if you think of any sport or any human athlete, they don't just complete their sport specific skills. It goes far beyond that. They have a strength training program, a body awareness program, um, and there's tons of research to back this up. So this isn't just me, you know, spewing out stuff saying everybody should be conditioning. There are there's tons of research to suggest that strength and resistant training actually will improve your strength, your power, your speed, your muscle mass, but of bigger importance, it helps to prevent injuries. So when we think of actually specific athletes, they require a greater amount of sort of specificity and individualization and variation to their program. That's why it's important when we condition our dogs and we work them out that we're constantly changing the workout. So again, going back to this bicep curl example, if I just did bicep curls till the cows come home, initially I'm going to get some strength in my bicep, but if I don't start changing it up a little bit, 
I'm just going to start a plateau and not get the same results that I'm looking for. Um, so when I think of conditioning, it is just such a crucial part in training any of our athletes. We ask a lot of our dogs and it's up to us us to make sure that they're physically ready for what we're about to do. And it gets even concerning sometimes when we get the weekend warriors. So the dog is sort of dormant during the week and then come the weekend, you know, they go out and they do their trials and things like that. Those are the dogs that I tend to worry about the most because they don't have some sort of conditioning program. And I know for me, mm -hmm. um, you know, my dog Quinn got injured, you know, this was about three years ago and I had sort of lapsed on her conditioning. I was so focused on the business at the time that I really didn't give her the time. I had done conditioning really well, then sort of fell off the wagon. And then all of a sudden she got injured after a competition. And uh, I'll be frank, it sucks when, you, when a dog has an injury, right? Not only is it mm -hmm. unfortunate for the dog who now you have to rehab back, but then you miss out on all the social aspects. I mean, this happened in June at the time. We had a whole summer of trialing. So there was no trialing anymore. There's no hanging out with my friends. Like I didn't have, I had my other dog, 50 at the time, who was just a puppy. So I had no other dog to, to show. Um, and my weed and terrier at the time, he wasn't quite well, so we couldn't show him. So it was really awful to be in that situation. And again, if I had just maintained that conditioning program, things would have been a lot different. So there's always the mm -hmm. risk of injury when we do any sport with our dog. That's par for the course. It's no different than us. If we tend to do a lot of activities, there is always the risk that comes along with it. Obviously, the benefits outweigh the risks, right? But there, there's true benefits to it. Um, so not only does canine conditioning help to improve Prove, you know your dog's strength and their body awareness and their flexibility their power um, it prevents injuries but also if your dog does get injured they tend to have a lesser degree of that injury because they're already in good shape so I always compare it back mm, to sort of my human absolutely. practice if you have you know two 80 year olds who both fracture their hip and one sits at home is inactive doesn't eat well um, isn't active at all and then the other one's out all the time out in the community and physically active who do you think is going to recover better it's always the one that has stayed mm. active, right? So conditioning plays such a big part um, in any of our canine athletes' health and should really be included. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It's, you know, two to three days a week, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and again, this is what I do. I help people set these programs up um, so that they, they reap those benefits. Because again, if we just do something now and then with our dogs, that's fabulous. And the dogs love it. They're engaged with us. But do we necessarily get the yeah. health benefits that come with it? Mm. Yeah. Carolyn, what role then does does warming up and cooling down play in the life of an athlete? If we now really get to our, you know, our subject for the day. Yeah, for sure. So warm up and cool down, it's um it's absolutely crucial in preventing injuries. This is probably one of the most neglected things that I see that owners can easily do to help prevent injuries and prepare their dogs to be your French ringer. I mean, there's so many fun sports that we that we play with our dogs now, right? And this isn't just for sport, and it's, it's, a, it's a very big misconception that only sport dogs have to warm up, or they only need to warm up before their mm -hmm. actual sporting event. And that's not the case. Anytime we have anything that's physically demanding on our dogs, so it could be we're going for a hike, we're going for a swim, uh, we're playing fetch, um, sprint work, attending mm -hmm. training class or our trials, warming up and cooling down is something that we should be doing before any of these activities. I mean, I think of just how many people, you know, step outside on their back lawn and they get their chuck it and they just start right off the bat playing, you know, 50, 50 chuck it's with the dogs. So we can't just do five. It, it seems to be this, this human trait <sighs> that we must play chuck it until the dog is absolutely wiped um, and at least 20 to 25 reps. <laughs> um, so again, it's, it's important to be warming up and cooling up your dog before any sort of um, exercise or tool that we're about to put on the dog. So Dr. Deborah Knapp at VOSM had said that injury rates could be reduced by 25% if owners took more preventative actions. So this is something that really resonated with me because as a physiotherapist, I'd much rather be proactive and deal with things yeah. before they happen than be reactive. I mean, obviously injuries do come up, but there's so many ways now that we can prevent injuries that I'd much rather take on that approach. Um, so mm -hmm. when you think of you know warming up and cooling down your dog that is one of the best strategies that we can do to prevent injuries in our dogs things like getting wellness exams by our health professionals or maintenance treatments on any of our canine athletes that might have an injury um, that's all such important stuff and that warm up and cool down is, is really no exception 
And when I'm talking mm -hmm. about warming up and cooling down today, it's it's all dynamic movements. And we're gonna dive into this a little bit deeper, but it's mm -hmm. it's actually getting the dog to move on their own. It's not that static stretching or passive stretching where we're actually physically manipulating the dog or moving their limbs around or anything like that. This is all the dog doing all the work. We're just sort of directing them in terms of what they need to do. Um, so when we think of actually, you know, a warm up, what does it actually do? So it, it helps to improve your muscle range of motion. Okay. It reduces the susceptibility of getting a strain in a muscle tendon or ligament. It helps to increase the heart rate and breathing rate, which is obviously important with an mm -hmm. activity that generally requires some sort of physical exertion, um, increases circulation in tissue. So brings in blood flow to the extremities, which is important because we need them to move as best as we can. It also helps to distribute joint fluid over the actual, uh, joints. So helps to improve lubrication and movement in that joint. Um, there's also the good mental focus, right? When you're warming up your dog, you're getting your dog in tune with you. You're working on connection. You're working on um, getting their head ready for what they're about to do versus just yanking them out of a crate and saying, okay, Fido, here we go. Let's go for our run or whatever we're about <laughs> to do. The other thing that I find is really important is that it helps to detect if there's something possibly off or wrong with your dog. So if we just pull our dog out from the crate and go to whatever we're going to do, um, we're not really paying attention to what their body's doing. But when we're actually warming them up and maybe we're doing some spins, and again, we'll get into this a little bit more, but later, um, if we're doing some spins or some downs and, and Fido obviously, you know, maybe doesn't want to go into the down or maybe he's not spinning very well to the left and better to the right, you start thinking, well, huh. Why is that? Is maybe something a little bit off with him? So it really helps to also detect if maybe something is not quite right with your dog right before you do that activity. And then from there, it's sort of your choice. Do I continue or do maybe I need to have this actually looked at? So the warm up is um, there's there's a lot of important things when it comes to that warm up, but the cool down is just as effective. So I see a lot of clients do a great job with the warm up and they're getting involved in it. And then the cool down is something totally different. They tend to forget about the cool down. Um, and that's ah. as physically beneficial as it, is, as it is mentally for the dog, right? I mean, I know back in the day, and I and you know what, as, as things have changed and, and research has progressed and we have more knowledge on this topic, um, I mean, I remember years ago with my Whedon's in the late 90s, I mean, the cool down was walk back to the truck, throw you in the crate, and go hang out with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't actually yeah. some sort of um, systematic, oh, getting my pen tangled. There wasn't sort of some <laughs> systematic approach that I used. Um, and when we think of the cool down, so um, there's sort of four main reasons why we cool down the dog and why that's important. So first off, it gives us some focus time with our dog just so we can praise them and say, you know what, you did a good job, kid. Um, even if you didn't, we still like to say you did a good job. Um, so it's just that time that we can sort of bond and, and come down with our dog from whatever activity we just did. Um, it can also cue them to settle and relax. Um, it helps to restore shortened muscles back to their original length. So when we've worked out, we tend our muscles tend to cramp up a little bit and they get shortened. Um, and we don't want prolonged state of shortened muscles because shortened muscles will create less power, which is not good. So if we're walking them out and we're cooling them down, we're really helping to lengthen those muscles back out to restore them to their actual length that they're supposed to be. It also helps to remove lactic acid buildup. So lactic acid is a very normal byproduct of working out. Um, but if it stays around and lingers too long, it can cause muscle soreness and fatigue. So by walking the dog out, you help to distribute that lactic acid. Think of, think of when you work out I mean this guys this is no different than when we work out right um you know having a proper cool down and you know if you do how many squats your quads are just on fire if you were to just stop your workout and then go jump into something else your legs will be that much more sore versus if you actually did a proper cool down loosen things up a mm -hmm. little bit um so the cool down arguably is is really just as important it just tends to be the one that we sort of <laughs> forget about <laughs> No. Yeah. I think there are two things that you've said now that have really resonated with you, with me. So like the first one would be even for non-athletes or for your weekend warriors, warming up is so important. And I mean, if I think of I'm it, me and my dogs are in no way shape or form athletes, but we do live on a big farm and we go for mm -hmm. long walks and it's awesome. But like my high drive German shepherd who has hip dysplasia will, you know, you know, jump up off of the bed that he's li been lying on for the whole day and hasn't moved and then run out the gate and start spinning and jumping and growing insane. And like just that, those initial few minutes where he's so excited is a huge risk for him to flare up his hips or create another injury because I haven't prepped him properly. I haven't warmed him up and mm -hmm. I haven't given him the opportunity to kind of just 
settle into our, the exercise that we're doing. So I think that one is is really resonated with me. And then I love that you're saying that you can w- use your warm up routine as like a kind of a test. So say that I have a dog who has a bit of a problem with with his back and he tends to get sore and I'm working with my rehab therapist and I know this and I'm using specific exercises and when I see my dog does X, Y or Z, I know that they're a bit sore and then I can adjust accordingly. I really like that. And that gives, like as rehab therapists, that gives us some amazing tools to work with our owners to say, these are the red flags you're going to see or not see and get to know that individual patient's patterns really well. I really love that. And you'll also yeah. know too, like so you also start what, to know your own dog, right? So as you do this yeah. more and more, you will know what your dog's norm is. So every dog, every dog is different there. I mean, we have how many different breeds? There are so many different structures and some dogs have hip dysplasia, some dogs have conditions and mm. you know what your dog's sort of normal is. You know what they should, at least we should know, right? And so again, if, if, you know, they have, you know, chronically tight muscles or things like that, you may be like, oh, well, that's normal for them not to turn as tight to the left, to the right. That's normal for them. But then if it comes to the other side as well, you're like, well, that's not really normal. And then to go back to your German shepherd. So that's something that I hear a lot of, right? Because I have a lot Mm -hmm. of clients that, that live on big properties and literally they just open up their door and the dog goes running out and they've been (laughs) sleeping for, they've been sleeping for how many hours, right? Mm. So in those sorts of situations, what I always recommend is you leash your dog for the first five Mm. to seven minutes. So that's sort of the warming up for them, right? So you have them on a leash, you're warming them up by just trotting and having them by your side because if they go out and suddenly explosive power, chase the squirrel, just dash out, oh my gosh, we're outside. I mean, dogs dogs are not self-limiting in any way, shape or form. They don't understand this stuff. But at least if you sort of have them on the leash for five or seven minutes, you're warming them up a little bit. And then you unclip that leash and then you let them go. And at least their body's now warmed up for them to zigzag left, right, and go all over the place versus just starting that off the bat, right? So, um, Carolyn, my next question is, what does a warm-up and a cool-down routine look like? What does it look like? Oh my gosh, there's, okay, so this yeah. is, this is, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a loaded question, right? Um, because th- there's a, there's so many different ways that we can do it, and there's no, really the only wrong way to do it is by not doing it. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I think first I'd, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about sort of the research behind it, just so we can sort of okay. tap into that, just so that people have a really clear understanding of why do we even need to do this? Cause that's an objection I get sometimes from people like, why are we, why, who cares about the warm up? Does it really even matter if we do it? And the reality is, is that we don't have a lot of research in the canine world in terms of what specifically a warm up and cool down looks like. So we've had to extrapolate a lot of research from the human side, okay? Mm. Um, And the reason why we know that we can confidently sort of make conclusions from the human side is even though humans and quadrupeds are very different, um, the way the muscles work and their recovery is very similar. So we can confidently pull the information from human research and sort of move it over to our canine athletes knowing that um, it's it's good things that we should be doing and uh, it helps to sort of guide our recommendations in terms of how many sets we do and why are we doing dynamic versus static and that sort of thing. So it's really important to understand the why first. Um, before I sort of make my recommendations in terms of what does a warm up actually look like. Um, so there's obviously the physiological benefits that I spoke to a little bit before in terms of, you know, improving the muscle range of motion, improving uh, blood circulation, um, increasing heart rate and breathing rates, so all those good physiological things. But what, in terms of actual guidelines, in terms of what the research has shown is that passive stretching. So when I talk again about passive stretching, that's me physically moving a dog's limb in some way, shape or form, not getting the dog to actively do something. Um, So passive stretching has been shown to be detrimental to performance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it decreases running speed in athletes, reaction time, movement time. Um, It decreases basically the max output of the muscle. So the muscle can't work as well if it's passively stretched right before an actual workout. It also doesn't decrease the risk of injury rate. Tons of research to support that. Whereas an active dynamic um, sort of program has shown to help reduce injury. Static stretching or the passive stretching can also have a detrimental effect on the dog for upwards of 24 hours. So if you have a weekend and you're doing a Saturday and Sunday event, if you go home Saturday night and stretch your dog afterwards, that can 
have detrimental effects on their performance the following day. So any protective benefit is really gained from an active warm up and cool down. Okay. Um, and again, these are movements where the dog is doing them. So they've led to better improvements in performance, in power, and any sort of agility based tasks. And this is again, all from the, the human side. So we want a recovery period of more than five minutes, but less than 15 to 20 minutes between sort of the warm up and when you're actually doing the activity. So it, you can't do the warm up two hours in advance and expect to have the protective benefit there for the performance. So you want to make sure it's somewhere between five to 15 minutes before you're actually going to compete versus warming them up too early. Um, the okay. intensity of the warm up should also be balanced against the length of the activity that you're going to do. So if you're going to, if you know, a dog is doing a very big aerobic sport, like maybe they're going um, sledding or something like that, and they're going to be working out for an extended period of time, I might have a bit of a shorter warm up. But if I know that I'm just going out and doing a sprint, then I know I'm going to have a bit more of a warm up before I go in um, because it's a shorter duration of the actual activity that I'm about to do. So we also want to make sure the total warm up time is less than 10 minutes. So there's been research to show that anything longer than 10 minutes can actually start fatiguing the dog and being detrimental to performance, which obviously we don't want. Um, so we want to find that sort of sweet spot somewhere between that five to 10 minutes. The optimal number of sets in terms of, you know, how many um, exercises we choose and how many sets, the optimal number in the research is two. Um, mm -hmm. If we start getting into three sets, um, then we are overloading the dog too much. And again, we're going to start getting um, some fatigue. So in terms of, you know, sets, I always tend to pick, you know, five or six exercises. Again, we can go through this a little bit more in detail, but I tend to pick five or six exercises, do them twice. So I do them, you know, five times, then I might do another set of them. Um, but I don't go into three sets because again, that's going to sort of overload the dog, um, which we, which we don't want. So that's, that's sort of the research and the guidelines behind why we do what we do. Okay, so that that's really cool because I was going to ask you about about the research specifically because um yeah Car Carrie and Adrian and I a while ago had a really interesting conversation about the research behind icing, which is mm -hmm. something that I mean we all use all the time, um, but it isn't as cut and dried as we like as we think it is. You spoke briefly about um, warming up and cooling down and, and specifically using ice um, in that cool down period. So I was wondering about like what research do we really have um, when we're looking at athletes and when we're specifically looking at warming up and cooling down um, routines and protocols. Um, yeah, so I'd love, yeah. Uh, is there research? Is there, Are we only extrapolating from people? We're only at this point, there really is not okay. great research in the canine world, unfortunately. And it's it's so much harder to get the feedback from the dogs too when they're warming up, right? So you really have to get a lot of objective testing in there, which we are lacking a little bit um, in the canine yeah. world. I mean, give it another five or 10 years and I think there'll be some more specific studies um, that have more ob objective measures and ways that we can actually calculate mm -hmm. this. Um, but no, mm -hmm. but again, given the similarities between the tissues, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we can confidently pull this information from it um, mm -hmm. and, you know, getting into exactly what specific sort of, um, you know, warm up do you do? Um, we can sort of get into that if you want, just kind of going over what a good warm up routine looks like. Now that we've sort of talked about the research, maybe I can dive into a mm -hmm. little bit, you know, what, what does a warm up routine look like and what should it include based on sort of the research that I just spoke about? Yeah, please do. And I must agree with you. Like it's I love to speak about the research because to me that's something that's really important. But the reality of our you know our industry, our field is that it's still new and it's still growing. And mm -hmm. when we need to extrapolate, we need to extrapolate. Um but in the same breath as clinicians working in the field, we can and should be doing research. And I really want us to start thinking about ways that we can implement objective measures and that we can start implementing, you know, research protocols into our daily clinic. Um, that's not going to add crazy time to our days. But that's me diverging. Please do tell us <laughs> what does a warm up and cool down routine look like. <laughs> You're you're not diverted. It's it's all good stuff, right? I mean, it's sort of we go off on these rants and tangents where yeah, we want more objective measures sometimes for this sort of stuff. Um, but I think you know, despite not having some of that specific stuff related to dogs and the actual research on proper warming up and cooling down, we know that it's important. We know that our dogs need to do it. So how do we do it? 
Um, yeah. So really, the purpose of that warm up again, guys, is to really prepare your dog for any sort of physical activity that they're about to do. So um, it's not just for your sports and your training, but it's for all the other activities that you do with your dog. So your warm up should last between five to ten minutes, and it should include two sets of each exercise. So again, normally I choose about five exercises um, in addition to some cardiovascular stuff, whether I'm doing shift some shadow handling or some trotting or some fast paced walking um, or things like that. And we really want to include movements that are about to mimic what your dog is about to do in the sport. And mm -hmm. this is a really critical point. Um, dogs move in three planes of motion. Okay. So they move medial sagittally, which is forward and back. They move dorsal, which is turning side to side and then transverse, which is basically cutting the body in half and those twisting and turning movements. Okay. Um, not all sports are three planes of motion. So let's take, for instance, dock diving, okay? Dog's jumping off a dock and they're going forward. Would I really need to warm up my lateral, like my lateral um, structures in my dog? Probably not because they're not moving in that way in the sport that they're about to do. So the key thing is, is that you shouldn't see any signs of fatigue when you're warming up because that will have a detrimental effect on their performance. So it's, if you start warming up for 15 minutes, that's going to be too long or doing too many of the exercises. That's too long. We really want to find that sweet spot of five to 10 minutes, picking sort of five exercises, doing them a couple of times. Um, and there's also some specific considerations that you need to have with your warm up as well. So if your dog has previously had an injury, we might need a little bit more focused time on that area for warming them up. Or if it's colder weather, right? And their muscles are a lot colder than if it's, you know, the 40 degree heat that we're currently in right now. Or if you've traveled a really long way and you get there and your run's coming up shortly, you know, your dog might need more time to sort of stretch out its legs because it's been in a crate for, mm -hmm. for travel. Um, also limitations of your own dog. So all our dogs have some little faults. We hate to admit this, but there's always little things. They might have a long back. They might carry a little bit of extra weight. They might have a little bit of a dysplastic hip, um, things like that. So we just have to really be, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, specific to our own dogs in knowing what are their sort of weak spots and then what do we have to do to make sure that we're warming them up properly so that we don't potentially get an injury from that. Um, also, the level of exertion that's about to come up, if they're going to be going for like a two hour hike, I'm going to keep to that five minutes. If I know we're about to do an agility run, then I'm going to keep more to sort of eight to 10 minutes because I know that it's a much shorter time frame. Mm -hmm. The other key thing to remember that a lot of people forget is once you do a warm up, say you're going to an agility event and you have multiple runs in the day, that first warm up you do doesn't cover you for the whole day. <laughs> And I think a lot of people think that they're like, well, I've done my warm up at nine o'clock in the morning and this will be good all day. And that's not the case. So we want to make sure that we're warming up before every specific run and not just um, once in the day. So that's yeah. that's a really critical yeah. part of it um, as well. So we, you mentioned a little bit earlier some things about stretching. And I know that um, in the equine world as well, stretching has been uh, an interesting topic over the last yeah. A couple of years where it's been you know you do it and then all of a sudden we were like actually it's not a good idea so um how do you incorporate stretching into your warm-up um do you do some passive stretching as a cool down active stretching as a warm-up what are the differences and um yeah how do you incorporate them yeah so uh, and just flag me down if we lose connection or anything just like wave at me or something and <laughs> okay stop talking um so no static stretching and passive stretching is not something that i incorporate um into any of my performance stuff at all okay um you know the night before the competition during the competition that is something that i will do at the end of it so mm -hmm. passive stretching definitely has its role and again guys that's when you're manipulating your own dog and the reason why we do passive stretching it does improve muscle length it improves joint range of motion to help sort of return a muscle to an elongated state um, increases tissue mobility. It's also a really good assessment for your dog. If you're passively stretching them out and you're like, well, Fido can reach to here on its right arm, but it can reach to here on its left arm. There's a difference. Why is there a difference? So it can help detect some things as well. So passive stretching definitely plays a role, but not on competition weekends or when you're about to go hiking or something. So I incorporate, um, passive stretching with my dogs once or twice a week in total isolation from any activities that they're doing. 
Um, but the reason why passive stretching is still important, again, just not when you're actually doing an activity, because those shortened muscles will create less power, which sets them up to potentially get injured if they're constantly in a shortened state. So it's one thing if they're just shortened for a little bit, but if it persists and we constantly have a short muscle, that's where pain can come in, um, less muscle output. Um, and now sort of that weakened muscle is trying to do more work from that shortened position. Yeah. So it's really this recipe of, of sort of disaster. Think of everybody right now who tends to be sitting more at home. Um, yeah. You know, we're sitting at our desks a lot. Our hip flexors are sort of in this tight position all the time. And then we go to get up and we're like, oh, geez, a little tight, a <laughs> little tight through there. And, uh, you know, I mean, this, this happens to us, right? And so yeah. it's no different than the dog. Um, we have to make sure that they don't have those tight muscles as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing is muscle tightness is also thought to create uneven pressures on the articular cartilage. So if that persists ongoing, that can lead to some degenerative changes as well, which is not a good thing. So tight mm -hmm. muscles, long story short, is not good. Um, I generally recommend, like I said, one to two times a week, I will passively stretch out my dog's front end and okay. hind end. And I sort of include that in sort of an assessment that I do on my dog to make sure that yeah. nothing is tight and that they're moving and they have good range of motion of things. There is a great book that um, I always refer people to. Um, it's called Healthy Way to Stretch Your Dog by Sasha and Ashley Foster. Yeah, I love Sasha Foster. Yeah. So I don't I don't know either of them, but I love their book. And it's just it has lots of pictures and explains how to do it and where your hand position should be. Um, so it's it's a fabulous book um, for those that want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but again, stretching has its role in terms of what we just talked about, mm -hmm. but just not when we're doing any sort of okay. high intense physical activity. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, I thought I thought as much, but yeah, the research changes all the time, right? <laughs> it does. Well, and back in the day, right, we used to stretch ourselves out and stretch like this yeah. and stretch our quads and do that. Exactly. And now it's like, no, no, you don't no, do that don't anymore. Do that. No, 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 we don't do that. Yeah. So um, we've been chatting a bit about habits this in the last few weeks. Oh, and yes. I think that this is such a big thing for us because mm -hmm. learning about it, like learning a new skill, like warming up and cooling down your dog, it's easy to do it when it's new and it's fresh. And then it kind of falls by the wayside. So how do we get our clients to and ourselves to get into the habit of actually mm -hmm. performing a warm up and a cool down and it's not just a new novel thing that they try yeah. for sure for it's sure and that's um, yeah. exactly and you know what this this extends to anything beyond canine conditioning or warming up and cooling down this goes to how many times that we try to do something and we're really great at it for three weeks and then we fall right off the yep. wagon think of i mean <laughs> you, you look at new year's how many people have their new year's resolution of we are going to work out on new year's and away we go and they go good for three weeks but then they're not really seeing the results mm -hmm. and there's no like major gain and you're like i don't see it and then next thing you know you fall off the wagon and you don't do it right mm -hmm. um it takes time to develop a habit and this could this could be a whole separate live stream i swear we could do two hours on this i'm talking about <laughs> habit formation because that is just so critical um it takes 66 yeah. days to create a habit and that's 66 days of every single day doing that habit right um, the key, so there's sort of four key things that I think about when we come to habit formation. So number one is we need to be consistent. So we have to consistently do something over and over again before it becomes an automatic process. We think of getting into our car and what do we automatically do? We put on our seatbelt. It is ingrained. It's not something we ever think about now. It is just so ingrained in us. But if we do things consistently, right, that starts to get towards habit formation. So consistency is the big one. Number two is time. We have to put in the time for it. OK, so it's not, you know, like you're saying you do it for two or three weeks and then you just fall off the radar. We have to go, guys, beyond that two to three weeks. OK, we have to just constantly do it every time and put that time in for it. We do need some discipline. At the end of the day, we have to consciously talk to ourselves saying, OK, we need to do this. This is why we need to do this. And having a little bit of self-discipline in there on top of that time and that consistency and then knowing what to do. That's always I think one of the biggest struggles for people is, I don't know how to warm up and cool down my dog. Like, I don't know how to do it. So then I'm just not going to do it. Um, the other thing too is having accountability. So maybe it's at an event where you're with your friend and you're like, okay, you and I are gonna warm up our dogs at the same time and we're gonna do it together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need that extra sort of support um, because it's that. not like you necessarily have like a coach somewhere or anything like that. Like when you're out and you're going for a hike, 
you don't have time to quickly call your coach going, what should I be doing? Right. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where sometimes it makes sense where you have an accountability partner or you check in with somebody going, Hey, how was your, did you do your warm up this week? When you went for a hike, did, mm -hmm. you know, what did you do with your dog and checking in with people that way? Cause sometimes that can help form that habit as well. So if we mm -hmm. put together accountability, time, consistency, discipline, and you know what to do, those five things will make you successful in anything that you attempt, warm up and cool down or anything mm -hmm. else in life. And it's about starting on one thing and focusing on one thing at a time. So you know what, if you're not quite prepared to do the warm up and cool down yet, just focus on the warm up. Just focus on picking yeah. a couple exercises and working on that and getting really good at that. Too often we overwhelm ourselves because we try and do too much. We're like, okay, we're going to have this bang up warm up, and then we're going to have a great cool down and it's going to be awesome, but it's not sustainable. We need to start small and then just slowly work the layers up and always going back to why are we doing this? Is I'm the person that mm -hmm. I need to know why I'm doing something in order for me to continue to follow through with it. Mm -hmm. But I want everybody on here to really think about why are we warming up and cooling down our dogs and what could it potentially cost us if we don't? Mm -hmm. And it's not something you're going to necessarily see right away. Um, but we want to make sure that we are implementing that warm up and cool down to get those benefits through injury prevention, mm -hmm. through improved performance, um, and through recovery in case our dogs do get injured. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's in for, it's important to sort of go back when we're sort of thinking about how do we do it? Do we do it? Do I want to do it? Just think back to your goals and, and why you, why you do need to do it, right? Because it sucks yeah. to be on the sidelines. We don't want to have our dog injured. <laughs> Not from something like this. I mean, there's always an inherent risk when we're doing sport, but yeah. if there's something like warm up and cool down is something I can control. I can't control the course designs. I can't control the weather. I can't control, um, you know, the different sports and, and some of the quick turns that my dog might do and slip on something. I can't control that. But what I can control is my, I know that my dog is warmed up before every single activity we do. Mm -hmm. And I know they're cooled down. That's something that's in my control. Right. So I think if we break it down and, and make it not too complicated, right, um, that that will help you to achieve it to becoming a habit. I actually had a client. It was so cool. She got she made this little like laminated card that she put on yeah. like a, a bracelet. And so she yeah. had it. So she had wear her bracelet every time she went to do agility. And then she'd look at the card that had the exercises that she would do. And then she'd go through it and she set a timer on her phone for how long she did each exercise. It was hilarious. That's fantastic. Look at that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I, I Take really it to the next level. I love like compliant people like that. That's very cool. Yes. I think you're very right. Like the why is so important. The why is mm -hmm. so important. And and also thinking about your risks. So like for me, weighing up risks is really important. And um yeah, I mean, if your dog is injured, it doesn't just suck to sit on the sidelines. It also sucks to feel like you're responsible for for that and it sucks to wonder if they're going to make a full recovery and if they're going to get back to their old self and if they're going to be okay and it sucks to feel like my dog is in pain and it yeah it's just that you know that injuries are not fun is the injuries enough. are not yeah it, injuries yeah. are not fun for anybody and again mm -hmm. there's inherent risk to activities that we do with mm -hmm. our dog but why not do something that you know you can control and minimize injury in such a big way with your dog it's critical. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that was really important. And then the other part that I want to know about is, is that, and then that links in with this is that there are some things that make it difficult for us to do warm ups and cool downs. So in the real world where we face real <laughs> challenges, what are athletes <clears throat> experience like both? Both the owner and the dog, what are the challenges that they're experiencing that are preventing them from forming warm ups and cool downs? And how do they overcome them? Yep. Ah, loaded question. Loaded question. <laughs> I like it. Um, I would say the most frequent objection I get to my clients, number one, is time. So they don't mm -hmm. know how to put in the time to do it. So we sort of get tunnel vision when we're at, you know, competitions and activities and things like that. And we get so focused on the upcoming performance, you know, visualizing our run or potential uh, pitfalls or things like that, that we sometimes forget to do the appropriate warm up because we're just we're so in the zone of what's going on or we have intentions of going and doing a warm up. But then we see a friend as we're going to the ring. And then we start chatting about the weekend and what we're doing and how their dogs are doing. I mean, we've all, we've all been there, right? Um, 
And then, you know, with the cool down <clears throat> after the run, if it's gone really good, then you're high-fiving all your friends and you're talking to them and your dog's just sort of hanging there panting. Or if it's like a terrible run and it's not going well, then you go and you know, commiserate with your pens and, and start talking to them about, you know, where it all went wrong. So we tend to we tend to forget about it, right? So it's that time component going like, how do I fit this in? Because I'm still sort of, um, I've got these other things. Um, but we have to make sure, again, going back to the why are we doing this? Um, and it only takes five minutes. Like if all you have is five minutes, even if you have three minutes, three minutes, I mean, you look at the research, any warm up is better than no warm up. So if time is an issue, then, you know, just realizing that even a two minute warm up is better than no warm up and mm -hmm. um, trying to really carve out some time. I mean, again, think of what's going to happen if you don't do this. So it's pretty mm -hmm. simple. When I, when I, when I put it in that perspective, going, think of the time of an injury, the cost of an injury, right? You say you don't have time before a warm up now, but if you have, you're going to have all sorts of time on your hands if your dog's injured, right? And so <laughs> we have to sort of put it that way. And I know I say it quite bluntly, but it's again, one of those things that I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, focused on and, and serious about that this mm -hmm. warm up is an, and cool down and we can get into the cool down after in terms of what we do. Um, but that's so important. So just think of the time if you don't uh, think of the time that you will have with your dog if they're now suddenly injured and that's not what you want. Right. So finding sort of <laughs> strategies around yeah. that. And again, going back, finding an accountability partner, having a friend that sort of checks in with you when you're at events going, hey, have you warmed up and cooled mm -hmm. down your dog? Sometimes you need that. You won't need that forever. It's only until you actually solidify the habit. But as you're solidifying any mm -hmm. habit, you need that accountability, that time, that consistency. Those are all mm -hmm. things, strategies that help to form that habit. Right. The other one mm -hmm. that I also get is um, not knowing what to do or structure it right? That's a big one. When you yeah. don't know what to do, what do you do? You just don't do it, right? So I have that warm up and cool down book of the canine athlete that was released two years ago. Um, and this book is it's a 40 page book and literally lists everything from why we do it to the research behind it to sports specific warm ups and protocols. It has over 18 exercises in it that you can implement how to train them how to do it. Um, so it sort of takes all the guesswork out of it because when we don't know about a subject, what do we do? We go research it. We read about it, right? Yeah. So this book is your one-stop shop for sort of, um, figuring out how do I go about doing this? Thus eliminating that one sort of objection of like, I don't know what to do. Well, there's a book that's 10% off today that will explain everything about how to go about and doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And again, lack of knowledge in terms of the real benefit or undervaluing, I think there's still people that are sort of on the fence going, is it really that critical? Is it really that beneficial? I want you to think if you were going out to do a two kilometer run, would you just get up from the kitchen table that you were sitting at and just run right away? Well, you wouldn't, right? So why are we asking our dogs to do that? So again, the more education, yeah. the more chats we have like this, I think are helpful to help just um, mm -hmm. expand people's knowledge in terms of the importance. The mm -hmm. other one that I tend to get is just running multiple dogs. So I have friends that are running between four to six dogs in an event and they're like, how do I warm up all these dogs? Um, but again, going back to even if you warm them up for two to three minutes, that is better than nothing. I just don't want these dogs yeah. doing any sort of activity that don't have their muscles, muscles warmed up because then the risk of injury just climbs up even higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So those are sort fantastic. of the four big ones I... that I find. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, we all live in a little ideal world in our minds where we say like, this is what we should do, but real life doesn't always match up to that. And it's important when we're yeah. speaking to our clients to know what are the things that they're going to have challenges with um, and that are going to make it hard for them to be compliant with us. And how can we give them those solutions before they even run into the problems? I think that's super valuable. Carolyn, where can people find it if they don't follow that link? Um, and you mentioned a discount. Yes, so they can get it directly off my website, McIntyre Canine Rehabilitation. Um, it's under the product section, eBooks, um, and the discount code, let me make sure I have that right. It's O as in Oreo, <laughs> OPH10. So there's one thing that I do wanna clarify on this too is yeah. I get asked a lot from people sort of 
What's the difference or, or can they use further warming up and cooling down exercises for a conditioning program? I get asked that a lot, wow. right? Like the differences between those exercises versus conditioning exercises, right? Because there's a lot of people that are trying to get into the conditioning world now in terms of building programs for their dogs and how they go about doing that. Um, and, and really, if we're looking at conditioning exercises, the difference between that, because a lot of the exercises in the warm up are similar. So things like sit to stand, stand to down, wrapping cones, going over a jump. Those are all warm up exercises that can easily be turned into conditioning exercises, but the end goal is very different. So with conditioning, we're really trying to fatigue the muscles and overload them. But in warm up, we're not looking to do that, right? We don't want to fatigue the muscles so much that then they can't perform in the activity that they're just about to do. So that's where it's a little bit different that way, okay? The other thing too is that when we condition our dogs, we tend to use um, sort of balance equipment, whether it's Fit Paws or Toto Fit or Flexiness. There's all sort of sort of fitness companies out there that offer products. Um, so in conditioning, we tend to use those, whereas in a warm up, I'm not sort of bringing out props or anything like that. I'm just literally mm -hmm. going out there and um, you know doing my exercises on the ground and that sort of thing. Um, and then with the warm up, really, you're including those dynamic movements that mimic the activity activity that you're right about to do. Whereas with conditioning, we might be working on different areas of the body, depending on maybe what our focus is that day. If it's a front end workout, a hind end workout, a core workout, and it's not, those warm ups are not intended to improve the dog's like strength and that we're not building strength in the moment. We're getting them prepped for their workout, but we're not building strength. That's mm. where the conditioning really comes in so just to sort of clarify the difference you can like so in this book with the 18 exercises you can definitely add those to an exercise plan and a workout but again your goals are very different between when you're conditioning your dog or when you're warming them up even though they're the same exercises ah i love it yeah so thank you so much everyone thanks carolyn if you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.